You're listening to Sports Radio Detroit. Sports Radio Detroit is proud to present the Whip and Nene podcast on SportsRadioDetroit.com SRD with your show hosts Pete Spivak, a broadcaster and horse racing handicapper, and Danny Garuder, a sports writer and horse racing handicapper. This episode welcomes guest host Aaron Hayes, who's a freelance horse racing writer and handicapper. And now here comes the Whip and Nene podcast on SportsRadioDetroit.com with Pete, Dana, and Aaron. Oh yeah, welcome in for another episode of the Whip and Nene podcast here on SportsRadioDetroit.com. SRD, I am indeed one of the show hosts. I am Pete Spivak. You can find me in the metro Detroit area for iHeart Media Detroit doing sports and traffic updates on the local radio stations. And with me are two of my usual co-hosts, one being the great Dana Garuder. Dana, welcome in, buddy. How you doing, bud? Good. Doing well, my friend. And then the great Aaron Hayes. Aaron, what's up, my friend? What up, though? How you doing, Pete? I am doing okay, gentlemen. I'm coming to you from uh, the studio with a very bad back. I've been on my back for the last couple days. i got the hot pad on the back right now. So if I do happen to stutter, that's because I had a sharp shooting pain going up my uh, the muscle of my back. My mom's house sold, so I've been doing some moving, and I decided to move her 75-pound chair like it was, I don't know, threw it aside like it was a bag of sand, and that cost me. So here I yeah. am. So what we do here on the Whip and Nene podcast is we break down the American prep race schedule, which leads to the Kentucky Derby on the first Saturday in May. The American, European, and Japanese horses compete for 20 gates at the Kentucky Derby by racing a 35-race prep schedule that runs between September and April. All prep races award points to the top four finishers and the top 20 horses with the most points. will earn a gate at the Kentucky Derby. There's room for 18 American horses, one European champ, and one Japanese champ. So that's how the Derby goes nowadays. And since we are entering March... As folks listen to this show, gentlemen, we're two months away from the Derby. Yeah. Yes. Two it's months on the away. Corner. Is anybody doing any future bets? I, I never do future bets because I, I think there's plenty of value on Derby Day, right? That's true. Aaron, are you doing any future bets? No, I agree with Dana. There's plenty of value on Derby Day. I, I, I don't want to see him two months out. I'll just take the first Saturday in May. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, there we go, boys. Two months away. I love it. We started the show. Obviously, we do our usual rundown starting in September, and here we are at the beginning of March. I love how it goes. Well, we have no races to break down from uh, last week because the the races were two weeks ago, so everybody knows exactly what happened, but I do want to quickly mention that sad news on February 23rd as Battle of Midway was working out at Santa Anita and he had a very major accident, and unfortunately, Battle of Midway was not able to recover and was euthanized. Uh, so very sad news that Battle of Midway, who is now five years old, uh, former Kentucky Derby contender, has left us uh, at five years old, so that is definitely some sad news, so I just wanted to pass that on. Again, Battle of Midway passed away February 23rd after a training accident, workout accident, I should say, at Santa Anita last Saturday, so that is Definitely some sad news. So with that, I guess we're just going to have to move on to the only race that we have coming up on Saturday. Uh, Well, Peter, by by the way, let's let's liven it up with some positive stuff. With our old friend Ryan Dickey went to Silver Charm's birthday last week. Oh, yes. (laughs) Silver Charm. How old is Silver Charm now? 20, what, 21? Or is it 15? Uh, I forget what it is. Silver Charm won the Derby in 97, which would make it's him... old enough to have a drink. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Our old friend Ryan Dickey was at Silver Charm's birthday party. Uh, since Ryan, I, we, 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 we all forewarned our listeners, since Ryan has moved to Kentucky, that he was going to invest full-time in the horse racing industry. Well, he is. He went to, he went, he went to, the, he went to a birthday party for a horse. You got to love it. 
Anybody have any comments on uh, on Smarty Jones? Or not Smarty Jones. Yeah. What was it? Silver Charm. I said Smarty Jones. Silver Charm. Any comments on Silver Charm? Yeah, I, w- I would like to say two things about Silver Charm. He was one of my favorite horses. One because that was also one of my favorite derbies because I hit it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and secondly, he, Silver Charm got a much better birthday uh, uh, a, a party than I did this year. <laughs> well, are you a champion? Uh, in my own mind, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> when you're a champion, won, we'll give you a grand I won birthday. I some Rex softball championships. <laughs> When you're a champion, we'll give you a grand. We'll give you a grand birthday party with lots of oats and hay. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's right, man. Aaron, did you ever bet on on uh, Silver Charm? Uh, that was a long time ago. I couldn't remember what I bet last year. He had around <laughs> 21, 25 years ago. But uh, it, it's it's cool to see that he's still uh, alive and kicking it, and and people can uh, actually go out there and enjoy his birthday with him. Do we have to worry about Ryan? Because, you know, obviously the three of us know, know him pretty well. Do, do, Aaron, do we have to worry about Ryan now that he's going to birthday parties for horses? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. It's, it's, got, it's got to be an 800 number for him to call somewhere if he continues to go <laughs> into these birthday parties for horses. I love it. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right, gentlemen. Well, let's get into Saturday's uh, race coming up. But before we do that, uh, before we break down our race... I would like to remind everybody to log on to Sports Radio Detroit.com SRD and check out the latest episode of the Out of Bounds podcast. Join Dave, Dan, and Jeff as they talk the latest sports and pop culture topics in the world today. That's the Out of Bounds podcast with Dave, Dan, and Jeff only on Sports Radio Detroit.com SRD. So let's proceed to Saturday's grade two, one mile and a 16th. $400,000 $400,000 Fountain of Youth Stakes from the gorgeous Gulfstream Park in Hollandale Beach, Florida. Race 13 on your card. Points awarded on the road to the Derby. 50 for the win, 20 for the place, 10 for the show, and 5 for fourth. And with the uh, races basically now being either for 50 or 100, if you win one of these races, you're basically in the Kentucky Derby. So it'll be a field of 11 horses, post time set for around 532 Eastern Standard Time. And the weather will be typical Florida weather, sunny and 82 degrees. 11 horses in the field with the seven-horse hidden scroll being your 9-5 to favorite. Aaron Hayes, what's your breakdown, my friend? Well, it looks like I'm going to have to take that 9-5 to favorite hidden scroll. His debut on uh, January 26th on the Pegasus uh, Cup Day, it was outstanding. He won, won wire to wire, winning by 14 lengths. Joel sat like a statue on him, and he didn't even move the whole time. They ran the mile on a sloppy seal track in 134 and 4, and it was just awesome. But what really got me, though, was uh, Bill Mott. He's not a very good uh, trainer debuting. Out of 321 starts, he only wins 8% of the time. And when he debuts at a mile or more, it's only at 3% in 52 starts. So this horse freaked and won by 14 lengths, debuting for Bill Mott. He might have something special on his hand. He got a 102 British speed rating. And I, 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 just, I just absolutely loved his performance. I, I, nine to five is a little bit low for a horse that's only ran once. But the way, the way Joel just sat on that horse, just watching the race visually, it was extremely impressive. And the 134 and 4, I know a lot of people aren't hip to times or they're concerned about them or whatnot. But later on in that day, for the grade three Fred Hooper, Aztec since he ran that same mile on the same track and everything, it was two seconds slower in the grade three. You know, a, a, a debut maiden was two seconds faster. I, I think that's quite impressive. And that 102, that 102 uh, British speed rating, that is, is very impressive. So I have to take Hit and Scroll on top. I like Global Campaign with Luis Saez to run second. Now, this horse, he's two for two. His last race uh, came at Gulfstream over a mile and 16th. He is uh, one of two horses to actually win at this distance at this track, the second being Bourbon War, who also won at a mile and 16th at a uh, golf stream, but I'm, I'm going to take him to run second. 
I like uh, Luis Saez. He's the second leading jockey at Gulfstream Park. And uh, trainer Stanley Ho, he, uh, he he does quite well in routes. He's in the money 82% of the time, winning 36%, even though it's just a low low sample size of, uh, of 11 races. But he's uh, two for two. He did digress in his last race that he did win with the speed running. But I'm, I'm not really too concerned about that. I, I see that he probably will sit somewhat off the pace, maybe around third or fourth. And uh, I'm sure that he will be able to close into the lead. I don't think he'll definitely, I don't think he will catch hit and scroll though. And for my third pick, I'm going to go with a long shot. I'm going to go with the 11 horse, Union's Destiny. Now this horse right here is going to have the outside post. And we know historically at Gulfstream Park, having the outside post going anything farther than a mile, well, going two turns, I should say, is, is not really a, a, a prosperous post for any horse, really. But I don't think that that will really be a factor for him. Obviously, I don't think he'll win. I don't even think he'll get second. But I think that he will be able to sit off the pace and he should be able to close into uh, hopefully third. He might get fourth, though. But for 30 to 1, I, 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 like him, I, I like him a lot, to be honest with you, to at least hit third or fourth. He had a, a, a bullet workout at uh, Gulfstream Park West, going five furlongs in a minute. In his last race that he did run, um, he had a 99 speed figure. And um, he's hasn't been off the board in three starts. He's uh he ran he ran third last time out at the uh, at Gulfstream, but I, I I think that he will be able to close into the pace. His trainer uh, Juan Avilia, he's in the money 71 percent of the time. Small sample size of 17 percent though, but he's in the money 71 percent of the time, winning 29 percent. Obviously, I don't think he'll win, but 71 percent of the time, even though it's only 17 starts. I, I, I got to respect that. I, I must respect that. And when he hooks up with uh, Lionel uh, Reyes, the jockey, those two are in the money 71% of the time, and Lionel wins 29% uh, of the time. So those stats are quite comparable. So I, I, I think I think that he should be able, well, not should, but he could hit the board at a very, very long price, and I, I, I would definitely be putting him in my um, trifecta and superfector. So with that being said, I'm going to pass it on over to Dana. All righty. Well, I too was blown away by Hidden Scrolls' first race, but it was so good. I just really don't know what to make of it. I, I, I mean, last year in the UAE Derby, Mendelssohn looked like Godzilla winning that race, which uh, what turned out to be a, uh, a, a very speed-favoring inside rail by his track. And Mendelssohn was not as, you know, he was a very good horse, but he wasn't a superstar. This horse might be a superstar, but, you know, because he ran on that sloppy track, I wonder if he's just a, a just a mud lover or a slop lover, and he won't be able to translate that uh, uh, speed on a fast track. We'll see. You know, if he, if he can do that again, he'll obviously emerge as the favorite for the Derby. I got to put him in the top three, so but he'll be, he'll be my third choice here. I think... There's a ton of speed here, too, and he's going to be challenged early on. So I'm looking for some closers here. And uh, I settled on uh, Bourbon War, who's a 10-to-1 shot in the morning line. He's got Irod Ortiz riding him, who's been the hottest jockey down in Gulfstream this winter. He's trained by Mark Hennig, who's been a longtime New York-based trainer. He really doesn't train a lot of big-time stakes horses, but he's he usually churns out a lot of wins throughout his career. This horse is out of Tappet, so obviously he's got uh, the distance uh, pedigree here. He's run three times. He, he broke his maiden at a mile, which was interesting that he entered him at a mile, and he won right off the bat. Uh, then he ran on the runs and stakes, grade two stakes, and he ran fourth, kind of a non-threatening uh, fourth there, but he was compromised by a slow pace. Then they shipped him to Gulfstream, and he won an optional claimer. What was interesting about that race was this horse bowled his way through two other horses in the stretch and, and pulled away for the victory. I like the way he, he ran in the stretch, and I think he's going to show a big sh stretch kick here with all that speed. My second choice is going to be Vacomo, who's right next to Bourbon War in the, in the post. 
Uh, George Weaver had a pretty solid uh, winter down at Gulfstream as the trainer of, uh, of uh, Vacoma. Manny Frankel is, is coming down from New York to ride him. This horse has won, run twice, and he won his maiden at six furlongs, running a 108.4, and then won the Nashua Stakes at Aqueduct at a mile and uh, ran, a, ran a very nice speed figure in that race, a 97 buyer speed figure, despite bobbling at the start. He's trained well, so this horse looks like he's got a lot of talent too. Uh, he's had a candy ride, candy ride, uh, uh, another distance horse, so no worries about that. So I'm looking at uh, Bourbon War to win this race at an upset, Vacoma to finish second, and then I'll have Hidden Scroll hanging in there for third, but I'm kind of hoping Hidden Scroll actually wins this race and runs back to his last race because then we could use a superstar in the field here, but I just, I'm skeptical until I see it on a fast track. So with that, I will turn it over to Pete. Well, I appreciate that there, gentlemen. Thanks very much for your breakdowns. One thing about the Fountain of Youth, uh, youth Stakes serves as a, a prep race for the Florida Derby coming up in late March. And also, uh, as I get into my breakdown, I want to mention that John Velasquez has four victories in this race, and that's the most of any active jockeys. So with that being said, let's talk about the one-horse Code of Honor, who missed the Breeders' Cup Juvenile and missed the Remsen. Uh, now, this horse's form, if you look at his three races, is obviously going backwards. Uh, so he can basically only improve and hit the board, in my opinion, uh, or fall off the radar. I mean, it's it's. It, I mean, Code of Honor is really at a point right now, especially being six to one on the morning line, where it's either make or break for Code of Honor. Uh, so I really think uh, that Claude McGahey the third is going to have Code of Honor ready to go in this race, especially at six to one. Again, John Velasquez has four victories in this race, most of any of the active jockeys, and he's riding Code of Honor. Code of Honor also training like a very uh, if if training if training uh, runs was uh, was awarded trophies. If horses were awarded, tr awarded trophies or awards, period, and training runs, Code of Honor would be the champ of all training runs. I mean, this kid has been training really, really well. So the one Code of Honor, I really think, is definitely a horse to be contended with, especially with John Velasquez on his back uh, coming up for Saturday's Fountain of Youth Stakes. But I want to uh, also talk very quickly about uh, the four-horse Bourbon War. I think the four-horse Bourbon War, who needs a very fast pace, uh, to uh, hit the board, we'll get that in this race. I see a lot of horses in this race going out for the lead. Here's the way I see the uh, race breaking from the gate. I see the 2, 3, and 7 going for the lead. I see the 5, 8, 9, 10, 11 doing the stalking job, and then the 1, 4, and 6 will be coming from the back of the pack. I think that horses like Code of Honor and Bourbon War will indeed, and Signalman, will definitely get uh, the pace that they need at the front, uh, with a lot of horses that do like to be on the lead. And some of those horses, like Frosted Grace and Everfast, will be coming from the outside to help speed things up as well. Uh, the four-horse Bourbon War uh, definitely will need that pace to come from behind. But one horse he's going to have to catch is going to be one of the stalking horses, and that is the five, Vacoma. I think that Vacoma adding Lasix for the first time, also going two turns for the first time, will distance be an issue is the main question for Vacoma. Coming off a very nice win in the grade three, Nashua at Aqueduct. So, I mean, he, he won that one by a nice length and three quarters at a mile distance. But now he moves up in class. He's going to go two turns. I wonder if Vacoma really can sort of make a bid depending on how fast the pace is. Signalman has to be considered the six horse. Uh, he has hit the board in all five of his starts. A late runner, as I mentioned earlier, needing fast early pace to catch in the end. I think he's going to get it. And obviously the seven, your morning line favorite at nine to five, hidden scroll, coming off a 14-length victory over a one-mile turn in the slop. And I think that Aaron made a great point about the horse that followed up hidden scroll in the following race, running two seconds slower in the exact same distance. I think that that has to say a lot about hidden scroll. So it may sound boring in eleven in an eleven horse field, but I like to pl I would like to play with in this race coming up the four five six seven. I think that those middle horses in this field 
will definitely be the top four horses in this race, aside from the one code of honor. So actually play with the one, four, five, six, seven. I think those are the horses that will uh, definitely bring you money. Watch out for the one code of honor. Huge question mark. Also, if the pace is right, Bourbon War and Signalman should have their way. It all depends on what Vacoma is going to do. So one, four, five, six, seven. But for me, I'm going to select either Bourbon War or Signalman as my winner. Uh, Aaron, do you have any more comments you'd like to make, my friend? To be honest with you, the horse that scares me the most to beat, not not beating, but to to make this race unfold up top is the three-horse Gladiator King. Now, obviously, I believe that Hidden Scroll has to go to the front. I don't think he'll stalk or whatnot, but I have no idea why there's three horses in this race at all. He only has uh, three, well, he has three wins, but two of them came on the turf. He's a, pretty much a, a turf sprinter. So I, th- this horse has no business in this race. He has only one way to go. So if, if there's a speed duel up front, it could be uh, with the three horse and the seven. And if he does his job, which I guess, I don't, I don't know why he's in there, but that, I think that could be the only danger to Hidden Scroll and, and they'll just tire themselves out. And like you say, all the horses from, from behind might come and get them. But I have no idea why there's three horses in there. And that could be, could be the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the downfall of Hidden Scroll in this race if he goes to the front and just guns them and they just duke it out up front. But makes sense. I mean, he is 50 to 1 on the morning line, so you wonder, like, what the heck? He is a turf horse. Uh, maybe they feel that maybe the class will do him some good. Who knows? I mean, that is an odd, odd horse for this field. Dana, anything you want to add? Well, I, I, I got to make a comment about that same horse and that this, this trainer and the, and, the, and the owner just love to run in these type of races. That's all it is. I mean, they ran in the Rems and Stakes, they ran in the Holy Bull. They just love to run on these big stakes races and hope they can pick up uh, a little check or maybe uh, hang out in the the owner's box with, it, with all the other you know, big stars, right? That's just, all they are. They're yeah, starstruck, huh? The of the big race of the day, you know, that's basically what it is. But the other thing I wanted to mention was that, which we haven't mentioned, is that uh, Max, Maximum Mischief was one of the uh, hot horses coming out of the two-year-old races and then disappointed in the holy bull is off the derby trail right now he has a, a leg injury and he would have been in this race too well uh, this is this is a loaded field this is probably the best field we've seen since the breeders cup so a uh, breeders cup juvenile i should i should say so this this is going to be an exciting race and obviously uh with with uh, bill mott's horse uh, running so well in in his uh, maiden race that brings more intrigue into the race of an already intriguing race. Uh, so I, I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see what, ha- what Hidden Scroll does in this race, whether he's a true superstar or whether he's just a slop, slop-loving uh, son of hard spun. Well, we will definitely find out at 9 to 5 on the morning line, that's for sure. Well, if you think this field is loaded, wait until our next show, boys. Coming up in our next show, for our fans out there listening, it's going to be a long one. And it's going to be filled with information. We have four prep races to break down for the next show, ladies and gentlemen. The three of us will be breaking down the Gotham from Aqueduct, the San Felipe from Santa Anita, the Tampa Bay Derby from Tampa Bay Downs, and the Jeff Ruby Stakes from Turfway Park. And the Jeff Ruby Stakes used to be known as the Spiral Stakes. Uh, But those four races we have to break down in our next show. I don't know if we're going to have enough oxygen to do that. (laughs) I think that race also used to be the Jim Beam Stakes. The Jim Beam Stakes as well? No, I think that I think it used to be named the Jim Beam Stakes. It's, that 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 particular race has gone through several different name changes over the years, depending on the sponsor. Well, one thing I do want to mention about the Jeff Ruby Stakes slash Spiral Stakes, it's at Turfway Park, and that's usually where you can find the great Ryan Dickey. So I have a feeling that he's going to be at the Jeff Ruby Stakes. I'm sure he will be. Well, <laughs> and I'll be, I'm sure he'll be betting all the other stakes, too. Oh, I'm sure he will, and he might have a few <laughs> Jeff Ruby stakes while he's watching the stakes. Aaron, anything else going on in your life, my friend? Uh, Not really. I'm just waiting on Saturday. You got it, my <laughs> just, friend. Just, just can't wait to 
to uh, get my kids to the babysitter and then go out with my uh, my beautiful wife and my uncle and bet these horses on Saturday. Good old Uncle Gary. Hope he's doing well. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, oh yes, good. he is. Especially, especially if uh, Hidden Scroll wins because I, I oh, know he likes him. He'll be doing really well then. <laughs> and a boy. Well, thanks very much, yes, gentlemen, indeed. as always. I appreciate your help. And thanks very much to our listeners for listening in, as always. And don't forget to tune into other shows and podcasts here on SportsRadioDetroit.com, including Out of Bounds Podcast, Parsons and Slow, Fanarchy, The Set Piece, Mitten Sports Talk, Grave Discussions, The Laugh Track, Spinning the Wheels, SRD Ringside, Wings, Pistons, Lions, and Tigers SRD. And don't forget to check back for more of the Whip and Nene podcast as the Triple Crown season progresses. So thanks very much for listening. A reminder, I am one of the show hosts. I am Pete Spivak. You can find me on Twitter at Son of USFL Dad. Aaron, where can people find you? You can catch me on Twitter, uh, ahaze24, that's A-H-A-Z-E-2-4. At on Twitter, you got it, Ryan. All right, Dana. Uh, I'm also on Twitter at D Garuder. Thanks very much, gentlemen. As always, thanks to our listeners, and don't forget what Stan Laurel says: you can lead a horse to water, but a pencil must be led. Good luck, hail, and farewell. This has been an SRD production. <laughs>